said we have a church. We ain't going nowhere. <laughs> it's six. Let's do it. Let's go for it. I mean, we don't want to stop. We want to get going right now. Father, thank you so much for everybody that's on the morning man call. You know, I love the morning man and nights. I mean, it's just such a blessing. I mean, it's really strange how we just, we've been doing this three and a half years. I mean, this is amazing. I don't know when we are going to ever stop. But thank you, Lord, for this time. Please bless our minds, our spirits, our souls, our bodies. We thank you for the penetrating, powerful, invigorating effect of your word. Paul said, I'm not ashamed for it. What's it? The word is the power of God unto salvation. We come under its impact, its influence, the infiltration of truth that will make us free. We bless you. We honor you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a matter if everybody didn't already say hello, morning man, to just say morning man right now. Matter of fact, everybody turn off the thing real quick. Turn off the thing real quick. Put, I mean, no, I mean, like, put up, put turn the mute off for a minute and everybody say one time. One, take your mute off. Take your mute off. One, two, three. Morning, morning man. 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 At one time. Oh, man. You can. Okay. One. <laughs> Two, three, morning, morning, morning. 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 <laughs> morning. <laughs> Something wrong with y'all. Well, yes, look, sir. <laughs> today I want to talk about uh, mindfulness. This is kind of like my new thing. I'm kind of stuck on a little bit. Of course, I'm coming back to that dysfunctional thing. Don't worry, I ain't finished with that. But I want to talk about mindfulness because I really believe you know, while we're talking about a faith mindset, it's also important to understand a very key component to a faith mindset is spiritual mindfulness. We say, well, what are you talking about, Pastor? The uh, mindfulness. Well, what I'm talking about is how conscious are you of God? How much are you thinking about God? Is God what you are most aware of and uh, and how much does your faith impact how you think and not just how you think but the content of what you think because I really believe that it's possible to be a Christian and at the same time not be mindful or aware of the Lord and our everyday presence. It's so funny how that uh, we can talk about God, we can study about God, we can learn about God, but then in our everyday practice, we really aren't mindful of God. It's like he's not real. It's like, you know, we talk about him like he was back in the Bible. It's critical that we have a sense of his, his existence, his presence, you know. And I really think that you got to catch yourself sometimes because you're doing things as if God is not with you. You react in situations like you're alone or you are on your own. I mean, you are interacting with situations where you're feeling as if you're overwhelmed. You are uh, at the mercy of a situation. And all that is from a lack of mindfulness. Because we have to be mindful and conscious of the fact that God is with us. He is actively um, moving on our behalf. I mean, he's not just a concept. He is a practical reality. And so I believe that's what Jesus was doing with. He was emphasizing mindfulness and um, when 
he was doing that sermon on the mount, and uh, he was talking to them. And well, let me see, Matthew six twenty five. I mean, he was talking about mindfulness when he said in the six twenty six chapter of Matthew, he says, "Therefore I say unto you," he says, "Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on." Is not life more than meat and body more than ram raiment? He says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap and gather the bonds. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? And then he says in 27, Which of you, by taking thought, taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they talk not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how shall not even much more clothe you, O ye of love, faith? Notice that faith is associated with what I'm thinking about. Faith is associated, or little faith is associated with me thinking about the wrong things, being overly conscious of things that are not important, not significant. And then the kicker is verse um, 31, where it says, Therefore, take no thought saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we be clothed? For all these things that the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. The heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. You got to be mindful of that. That, that, I, that I don't have to, I'm not going through life trying to make it. I'm trying to get things. He knows. He knows. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. And verse, that's when he says, for take no thought for tomorrow. For tomorrow shall take thought of the thing itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Mindfulness. In other words, don't engage your mind in ways of thinking. For well, God is not in your thinking. It's so funny because Isaiah, I think I've mentioned this before, morning man. It's one of my favorites. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Isaiah 26, chapter 20, and third verse says, says, therefore I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. And one thing we were saying the other day is that the measure of how much you trust God is in how aware and conscious you are of God. There's a direct correlation between your ability to trust and what's going on in your head in terms of what you are thinking about. God intends for us to trust him because we are aware of him, conscious of I guess what I'm saying is, how much is God in your thoughts? I mean, is your everyday experience how, in your everyday experience, how impactful is the Lord and how you process things and how you react to things? I think the thing that Jesus um, expressed to disciples when they reacted to that storm. I mean, the thing that I think agitated him the most about how they panicked and said, carest thou not that we perish? I mean, I think the problem was that he was concerned about how mindful they were of God being with them. He said, where's your faith? But where, how is it that you do not have any faith? And I think that was a direct a challenge to their lack of mindfulness. And it can easily happen. 
something happens and you just start reacting to it. You start dealing with it. You're like, ah, you're on the ball with me. Da, da, da. And it doesn't even dawn on you that, wait a minute, the Lord is with me. <laughs> I got the Lord with me. Why am I acting like I'm I'm alone or I'm all lost? Well, what am I going to do? And I was like, hey, 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 I'm right here. I'm right here. You know, and, and, and I, I guess the reason why I want to talk about this is, is that it is very possible to know God, but not be mindful of him, to completely ignore him. Act like he's not even there. It's like Jesus said, you know, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why is it important for the heart? Because the heart is the thinker mechanism. The, the heart is the decision maker desire that's why you have to what's coming from your heart which I told you is your subconscious that's really what you're thinking okay well you can have these little outward shows and stuff but really what you're thinking is coming from your heart it's like Paul said you have a form of God in it where you deny the power thereof and I really believe God intends for us to be mindful of him. I mean, you know, Romans 8, 6 says, be spiritually minded. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I mean that literally. That when you are spiritually minded, first of all, you're full of energy. You have the injection of uh, vitality. Yeah, you're energetic. You feel strong. And then also you have a, uh, you're comfortable. You have a prevailing sense of well-being, peace. Why? Because you are spiritually minded. You are mindful, you know. When you're conscious of the Lord's presence, there's a significant increase in the quality of your life experience. Now, today could be a really good day for you. Today could be a really good day. But in fact, this could be a very good week. I know it's Thursday, but still, we can start today. And the reason why it's going to be such a great week is because of the time you experience with the Lord. As I was telling you the other day, it's not what the Lord does for me. It's the Lord himself. David said, he is my portion. <laughs> I think sometimes we're so caught up in what he can do for us. We don't realize the best part of the Lord is the Lord himself. And so the awareness of his presence today. I want you to pray. There's a song, no. My mother was a brilliant lady. And she introduced me to so many great things to read. One was practicing the presence of God. It was by this Quaker about doing the, uh, um, back in the 1700s. Uh, Brother Lawrence was his name. You only know his last name, Brother Lawrence. He wrote a book, Practicing the Presence of God. My mother gave me that book. And uh, he talks about in that book about how that the presence of God should be something that we practice. I mean, make ourselves aware. I think we should engage the Lord. And that the great thing is his presence. The effects of his presence are just immeasurable. I mean, and, and I really believe it is his presence that allows us to have a mindfulness. I mean, David, um, David really, really has a lot of examples of this. He says in uh, Psalm 16, 13, 16, 11, he says, that will show me the paths of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there are pleasures 
forever more. In um, Psalms 140 and 13, it says, Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thee, to thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. And uh, I love uh, when Moses, uh, you know, was talking to the Lord one time, and he used the word presence in Exodus. Um, well, I didn't write the name, name, name down. Okay, so I didn't put the number down. Sorry about that. But it says, he, and he said, thy presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Rest meaning comfort, meaning security, meaning not needing to, to wrestle with stress. He said, my presence will go with you. <laughs> and you know what my favorite is. I know I quote this a lot. If you ever listen to me, there's certain scriptures I keep saying. You know what? Because they mean so much to me. You, you know I live off the word. Okay, this isn't like a job for me. This isn't just something I'm just trying to give y'all a teaching. I believe this stuff down to my bones. And I have made it depending, relying on God's word. And there's certain scriptures <laughs> that are literally the basis for my hope, my trust. And Psalms 23 and 4 says, yea. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley in the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I sense the Lord with me. And then he says, he says, for thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, the rod is the is the um, part of part of the, the staff, so to speak, that just has a little sharp area to it that he could poke and strike the sheep, the shepherd. More of a corrective mold. And then the other part is is a little hook part. Where he could rescue, correction and rescue. He said, that's what comforts me. That puts me at ease. The fact that I feel him correcting me. I feel him you know, pushing me in the right direction. And then when I get in a jam, he rescues me, pulls me out. Directs me. I love how David said, the valley and shadow of that. You know, uh, the dark, shady place we can't see clearly. And then there's the danger, the threat. But guess what? His presence. His presence puts me at ease. And pre periodically, he prides me. Or he rescues me. Just little ways to let me know he's near me. Does God do that with you? Just ways you know, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Mindfulness. Now, so I want to say that I think great faith is tied to mindfulness. Our faith is fed by mindfulness. When God is in our thoughts, Faith exists in our hearts. And when you are most aware of the Lord, that's when you're most confident about your situation. The sensing of his presence completely changes how you see a situation. You know, it's like when you're most conscious of God, that's when you're most optimistic. Because the consciousness of God makes me less conscious of myself. Now, you know you're your biggest distraction. You know when you're going down, when you start thinking about yourself. <laughs> when you're thinking about yourself, just know right away, 
I am sinking. You see, Peter was fine when he was walking on the water because he was focused on what the Lord said, come, and he was trying to get to Jesus. And so he just, Jesus said, come, he just came. He was like thinking about one thing, I'm going to go with what Jesus said. But what happened was he looked, he looked around and he saw the wind and, the, and he started thinking about himself. He started thinking, man, I'm going to drown. Man, I'm going to drown up in here. <laughs> and then he started to panic. He said, help me, Lord, help me. And Jesus was like, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? In other words, why did you shift off of being mindful of me and become mindful of your own welfare? Wherever you become the center of your thoughts, all confidence and faith dissolves. And if you haven't noticed about the devil, the devil always tries to make you conscious of yourself. Remember that scripture where Jesus told um, Peter, he said, get thee behind me. I'm going to get behind me, Satan. Then he says, thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. There is a direct strategy of the enemy to get you thinking about your own welfare to distract you from the fact that God has got you. God is responsible for you. Do you realize that? Do you realize he is not going to let anything happen to you? I mean, you might not be aware of it, but you haven't made it because you were smart or because you made good moves or because you were alert and you kept things from happening to yourself. You made it because there's been an invisible hand. There has been a, a barrier, a hedge around you. And when people wouldn't do you harm, and when things could have happened to you, they bounced off the angelic presence of God, the power of God. The, David said, thou art my shield. Do you know that you have a shield? And things, things, the enemy plotting and planning, but guess what? Every time it just hits up against a shield, an invisible shield. Because um, you might not see him, but he is active. Like I was here on Sunday. I mean, he is actively working on your behalf. Active. To the point where no weapon that's formed against you can prosper. Every tongue that's your right. Sometimes you worry about your reputation. You don't know what people are going to say about you. Don't worry about that. <laughs> God is ensuring that nobody can curse you. They can talk all the talk they want to talk, but the blessing of God is on you. And um, I really believe that sensing his presence is the key to mindfulness. And it's like a lot of times the only thing that can give you hope is the fact that God is with you. I mean, there's nothing else God gives you to believe than the fact he's with you. That's the only thing he gives you. He doesn't tell you how he's going to move. He doesn't tell you what he's going to do. He doesn't tell you where it's going to come from. The only thing he tells you is, I'm with you. And that's all you need. You don't need any other information, okay? Aside from the fact that I know I'm going to be okay. You know why? Because he's with me. I really believe our sense of security is in the fact that we have to be mindful that he's with. Excuse me if I seem repetitious, but I need you to get this simple reality. God is with me. It's so funny when Jesus was talking to the disciples at the Lord's Supper, and they were so upset. They were suffering from some serious separation anxiety. 
when it finally hit them that Jesus was indeed going to die, I think they thought before that he was talking figuratively. I think he, they, he, they thought he was talking symbolically dying because he had used that the word die many times. If you look in the teachings of Jesus, you know, he uses death a lot of times symbolically. Like a grain of wheat falls to the ground and die, you know. So, so, so I think it wasn't until they were they were at that Lord's Supper. I think it was then that it hit them. He's really gonna physically die. Whoa! And man, let me tell you, they went through some withdrawals. Man, you know, anxiety just. He said, "Let not your heart be troubled." You know, they were really troubled. They were very, very worried about, about what this is going to mean. You mean to tell me you're not going to be walking with us? You're not going to be with us physically? They were like, oh, no. And it's so funny because the response that Jesus gives them is that he tells them that um, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He says in, in um, verse 16, 7 of John, he says, I tell you, I tell you the truth. And it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. And if I depart, I will send him unto you. And then another place he says, 14, 16, that he may abide with you forever. And then if you skip two verses down, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In other words, Jesus acknowledged the need for us to be mindful of his presence. And that is the job of the Holy Spirit. And it really makes sense since we've been teaching about the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Because the Holy Spirit being the spirit of truth means that truth is what he conveys to us and truth is the medium of his presence and links us to God. I mean, I've been telling you that your way of thinking is the spirit that you have. The spirit you have is the way of thinking that you have. When you have a spirit of fear, that, that is a way of thinking that is fearful. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit being the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit gives us truth to think so that we have the Spirit of God being one with us and we operate in that Spirit. And that allows us to operate in truth, not in any false reality, but in truth, the accurate appropriate representation of what exactly is. That means that we are drawn from truth, living in truth. We are mindful of truth. To be mindful of truth is to be mindful of the Holy Spirit. And like I said, a lot of times we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we don't really know, you know, what God is going to do. But one thing we know is he told them, he said, look, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is going to be with you. And once you have the Lord with you, you got all the security that you need. You just sit back and relax. It's going to be all right because the Lord is with me. I don't know of a single instance in the Gospels, what should I say, in the book of Acts, or even in any of the material after Jesus rose, sent the Holy Spirit, where the disciples were missing Jesus. I mean, when Peter was in that prison and he's supposed to die the next day, there's no evidence that GP was like saying, man, what would Jesus do right now? I need Jesus to tell me what, I need, I need help, Lord. No, he sensed. He sensed that God was with him so much so that he slept so hard that when the angel woke him up, tried to save him, he didn't know he was awoke till he was outside. Now that's some serious sleep. 
could you sleep when they told you you're going to die the next day? But that's just how aware he was of his presence. When he walked up to that man, he and John walked into that man at the temple. He says, he says, Jesus Christ make it be whole. He spoke about Jesus in the first person. That's how conscious he was of Jesus. And, and so I really think the Lord is our saving grace. It's like the fact that he's with us should put us all at ease. When we're mindful of him, and that's what the promises of the Bible are for, to keep us mindful. The promises make us aware and conscious of the fact that there has been a word spoken. And that word spoken is an indication of God's commitment to us. And our mindfulness of God is the key to our disposition, our temperament, our attitude, our approach, our perspective. <laughs> You even notice how a child can be all upset and be worried and, you know, when mama come around, they're just perfectly at ease. Mama's presence reigns. And that's the same thing God does. God puts you at ease. And I believe the greatest promise God gives, the greatest promise God gives is that he will be with us. Like I said, the only thing Jesus promised them is he said, I will be with you. That incorporates anything you might want, anything you might need. If God be for me, who can be against me? And, and so I guess what I'm saying is, God is as real as you are mindful of him. Do you hear me? God is as real as you are mindful of him. Your mindfulness of God is really what determines your capacity to trust him, to rely on him, to draw from him. And, and I just want to ask you, how, how mindful are you of the Lord right now? And, and I think that's the challenge. The challenge in life is to stay mindful of the Lord. That's what a test is about. That's what a trial is about. That's what the strategy of the enemy is all about. When Paul says, stand therefore in the Lord, he's talking about that specifically. Stay strong in the Lord. Stay mindful of his presence. Stay mindful of his, you know, you don't allow anything to get you to take your mind off of the Lord. That, that you don't let yourself, and, and self, is, like I said, is your main distraction. You know, because you're, you're thinking your mind that you, you got to do something for yourself. You have to protect yourself. You have to, you have to make sure somebody doesn't do something to you, or you gotta keep people from hurting you. You got to listen. That ain't nothing but a stress headache. Okay. <laughs> when you are conscious of the fact that the Lord is my help, my source. I mean, sometimes a situation come up and you start thinking about the situation. No, don't ever stop being mindful of the Lord and get into the situation or get into people. Don't let people distract you. You can't please people. And you can't figure them out. Okay, stop trying to look. Even what they tell you they did or why they did it, they ain't even reason. Okay. I'm not saying they're lying, but they don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> you say, why did you do that? Oh, well, you see, what happened was, <laughs> you're like, well, I can't understand how to. <sighs> Look, do not study evil. Keep your mind on the Lord. Let me tell you something. 
I've been passing a long time. And my biggest test is keeping my mind on the Lord. Because the people can get you all discombobulated. <laughs> Humans are complicated creatures. And so I really believe that the big challenge for us in the church is that we are dealing with distraction. I mean, the enemy has unleashed a strategy where he has the world just distracted by so many things. It was a time when you had to try to get people to think about the Lord and not get them to think about evil. It's gone to another level now in that you can't even get people to think about the Lord at all because he's completely out of the public eye. And the God is just, people are so distracted that you can't even get their attention. You say, the Lord wants to save you. They're like, who is the Lord? <laughs> I mean, we have a generation of people who don't even, I mean, it used to be, you have people that go to church and then they just didn't want to do right, whatever. But now you have people who never even seen the church, don't even know nothing about the gospel. Not, you talk about Jesus, they're like, who is that? Who was he? What did Jesus ever say? <laughs> and that's because the enemy is distracting people from the gift of salvation, the, the, the greatness, you know? Because I believe your greatest threat the greatest threat is for you to lose your mindfulness of God. And that's when you get caught up in your situation, things going around. Confusion is the strategy of the enemy. And you're confused when you're not mindful of how the Lord is with you. You have a, you have a, a flawed perception of the way things are, whenever God is not the focal, the center point of what you're thinking. That's confusion. And as I said, distraction is the main hindrance. That's why thinking about the Lord makes it possible for you to have a life experience because thinking about him is the initial approach to interacting with him. Don't tell me that you're interacting with the Lord if your mind is on something else. It starts with your thinking. And when the Lord is in your thoughts, there's the opportunity for this going back and forth, this dialogue that can take place with the Lord. You see, there are three forms. Let me just tell you, three forms. One at a time. Says, okay, first of all, there's there is this element where when I am mindful, I'm connected to his voice. Yeah, I'm talking about an ongoing day-to-day, moment-to-moment dialogue that goes on. It's not like I have prayer in the morning and then I go into my day. No, there is this exchange going on where there is a stream of information, dialogue going on between me and the Lord. God is accessible all twin. I guess the best way to put it is, God, I'm on God's channel. <laughs> and he's accessible to me 24 hours a day. You know what the scripture said, pray without ceasing. It's not saying have your eyes closed outside of your bed praying. What he's saying is stay in a mode of mindfulness where there is this constant exchange and awareness. Exchange. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that preceded, preceded is a present thing. It's not something that preceded at one point. Let me go read my Bible. Don't get me wrong. Ain't nothing wrong with reading the Bible. But I'm just telling you, God never intended for you to depend on something he said. He intends for you to 
to depend on things he is saying. And if anything, the word sets the tone so that you can understand what he is saying. But the word itself, without the same, the present day ongoing communication of God, that's the difference between Lagos and Rhema. You don't get faith from Lagos. That was a big fallacy of the faith movement is they taught people to memorize scripture and they taught people to claim scriptures. And there's no power in claiming words on a page. The power comes from the reign of a spoken word, which is right now present. You don't have faith till God talks to you. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the uh, word from God. When he says a word from God, he's talking about the voice of God. He's talking about God speaking. Now, sometimes God will anoint a law of God's word, a word that he spoke in the scriptures, and then he will make that applicable and applicable and relevant and speak that to you right now. Then you have faith. But you ain't got faith because you decide you want to quote a scripture and claim a scripture. I'm claiming this scripture. So many people died because I'm claiming my healing. I'm not taking my medicine. I'm claiming my healing. Did the Lord tell you not to take your medicine? No. He told you to trust him. And he will tell you whether or not to take your medicine or not. The pastor was talking that time about the lady said she got heard somebody give a testimony how they don't God heal them and they don't wear their glasses anymore. So she decided, I'm claiming that for me. And then she had a car accident. Because <laughs> she couldn't see. Put your glasses on. Now, if the Lord tells you to take your glasses off, but that's a rhema word. But get confirmation too. <laughs> And that's the problem with a lot of people is they go out and they ain't got nobody around them that they're accountable to and they don't got nobody around them that they can bounce things off of. And listen, all prophecy is to be judged, okay? And don't live in a way where nobody knows what you're doing and, you know, have some people around that you can say, you know, the Lord, I was thinking, I feel, I'm feeling led to take my glasses off. They can tell you. You got to keep your glasses on. <laughs> but it's so important to understand. Mindfulness is in three forms. His voice, worship, and trust. You got that? His voice, worship, and trust. Throw it out because I might run out of time. But first of all, there is an inner voice that is the medium of God's presence. I told you about sheep. Sheep. She can't see too good, and sheep are in the middle of a big crowd of other sheep. There's a lot of noise, confusion. If you look at them, they go, ah, oh, I'm bouncing and bumping into each other. But you know what keeps them on place is the voice of the shepherd. The voice, the shepherd is talking to them. And, the vo and everything in the 23rd Psalm are voice commands. All of us triggered by voice commands. Because we are voice activated. We can't see God physically, but we follow what? His voice. His voice is over there. That's the direction we go in. In the same way, we are mindful of him when we are linked to his voice. Secondly, worship is a lifestyle. Worship isn't something I do on Sundays or I do when the praise team sings. Worship is something that is my state of mind. My state of mind is I am thinking of God's word. I keep myself aware of his greatness, his power. I'm always thinking in terms of how he is king of kings and Lord of lords. The whole earth. Think about that. If I'm mindful that the whole earth is full of his glory, can I be intimidated by anything that's going on in my life? You know, it's like you have to have worship go, go from 
a practice to it being what you're mindful of all the time. And then last, trust, trust, voice, worship, trust. Trust is the inherent posture of my heart. And trust is not what I do, it's more where I am. Trust is a place. I'm in a place where I'm positioned in a way where I'm completely drawn upon God as my source. He is the basis of my confidence. He is the one I look forward to or expect for everything. I mean, this is really prevalent in uh, with David in the Psalms. Yeah, he talked about he talked about how that that God is a place and that his trust came from where he was in relationship. See, if, if you're mindful of God, you have a perspective, a, a sense of where you are from a place of security. And I really believe that in Psalms 32, he says, thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt come past me about with songs of deliverance. Thou art my hiding place and shield. I hope in the Lord. That's Psalm 119, 114. Psalm 27, 5 says, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And I said this earlier, but I want to repeat it. The most important influence on the quality of your life experience is what is on your mind. When you have the wrong things on your mind, you cannot help but have a miserable experience. And it doesn't matter how ideal your outward circumstances might be. If you're not thinking the right thing, if you're haunted by thoughts, bad thoughts, you're going to be depressed. I mean, and I really think the most notice, noticeable change that takes place when we get saved is that our thinking changes from bondage to freedom. Salvation is about receiving relief from a way of thinking that was deplorable and downhearted. The lifting of our spirits is the result of the born again experience. And so in closing, because I got to close. We got to make a concerted effort to keep the Lord on our mind. You're at your best when the Lord is on your mind. And the, that's why the power of medica meditation is so powerful because it's an exercise that makes you focus completely on God. And when you give your undivided attention to the Lord himself, he becomes magnified. He becomes, um, well, more vivid. You become more aware I mean, when you concentrate on the Lord and he becomes your focal point, when you really center in and zoom in and hone in on the Lord and his, his beauty fills the temple. I mean, when you do that, it's literally therapeutic. It's, it's enlightening. It's, uh, it's relaxing. It's uplifting. There's a direct correlation between how much you think about God and how good your life is going to be. Praying and spending time worshiping the Lord is like taking a vacation. Literally. If you ever like go on a vacation, you're like, man, it's so nice to be out here. I ain't at work. I ain't got the problems. I don't No, I'm telling you, when you when you resort to God and pray, you literally go to a place. You go to a place. David talks about going to a place. God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in the time of need. 
I resort to him, he's saying. That's Psalm 46, 1. Oh, look, you remember that time when Saul threw that javelin at David and David had to flee because Jonathan told him, man, he's trying to kill you, boy. You got to get out of here. Psalm 57, 1. You got to read 57, 51, 7, 1. 57, read 57 because that's when he, he's, he, he writes a song when he's playing. He says, he says, be merciful unto God, unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, says twice, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I wish I could read the whole thing, but just read me. That's, David was like, I got to resort to God. And uh, 91 too. now you know I love Psalm 91, but the second one said, I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Notice that. Notice the imagery. My fortress, you know, my hiding place, my shelter. Speaking of shelter, Psalm 61, 3 says, for thou hast been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. Psalm 7 and 3 says, be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou has given commandment, for thou art my rock and my fortress. I mean, Jesus modeled this for us. Jesus modeled this for us. You know, if you look at Luke 11.1, um, it says that, it says that Jesus Praying in a, in a certain place. Or Matthew 14, 23, it says, it says this. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when evening was come, he was there alone. I'm telling you, prayer is a resort. It's going to a resort. And when I when I take time to make him all I'm thinking about at the time, it equips me for when I can deal with everything else that's going on. Because it allows me to be mindful. It allows me to be in a state where I am conscious and I'm aware of his abiding power. It's so funny because Isaiah, Isaiah got called into the ministry by God raising his mindfulness. It's when he had that vision where he saw that the whole earth was full of his glory. That was when he was ready to go forward and declare the gospel. Because if the whole earth ain't full of his glory, we all in a whole bunch of trouble. But when I'm aware of the totality to which God is in, when I'm mindful of that, ain't nothing going to intimidate me. And so far, I love that account. I wish I could preach that every Sunday. Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. <laughs> and God said, he put, they pulled them all together and they had prayer. Even, he said, even the children, the little ones, because that big multitude had come up and the prophet said, look, do not be dismayed by reason of this great multitude. In other words, don't focus on that. He said, appoint me singers. And I want y'all to sing about the beauty of holiness. I need you to just focus on me and have the singers get in front of the army. You put the singers in front of them? Yeah, put the singers in front of the army. And I want you to just sing to my glory. I want you to just focus on me. Because you're not going to fight this battle. I'm going to fight this battle. <laughs> All I need you to do is be mindful. Listen. Stop thinking you got to do something. Stop being frustrated because you can't make things happen. I need you to be mindful of the fact that God is my source. 
God is my help. He's my deliverer. You know, I need you to magnify the Lord. They, they was, oh, magnify the Lord with me. You know what that means? To establish that God is great. Be mindful of the fact that he's greater than anything that is against you. Anything that could be attacking you. I need you to be mindful. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word because your word reminds us and makes us mindful of the fact that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Thank you that your word lets us know that we are absolutely not at all in any danger because your hand is beside us and your presence, presence is with us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, make us mindful today, all day of your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Matter out.